So we are in our second outline, which as you see is much longer than the first one. Oh dear. But that's the way it goes. We'll see how we last. Also, I want to mention this. I've not listened to it yet, because Rob Sullivan, the super IT guy of Rafiki, just gave this to me. It's mine. You can't have it. This is the book of Revelation on two CDs read or spoken from start to finish, NIV version, through the accompaniment of the London Symphony Orchestra and recorded at Abbey Road Studios. So if you like the Beatles, you're good to go, right? From memory. From memory. From memory. And you can tell that by watching her as you watch the CD. Oh, wait a minute. We can't do that. But anyway, now Jane and I have something to listen to on our return drive up to Tennessee. So her name is um, Karen Heimbuck. You see how tiny that is? For a guy who complained about the font size on the cross-references in the last hour, I don't write very big. But anyway, if you're interested, Karen Heimbuck, The Revelation. So... Okay, again, this is a second kind of getting ready to read Revelation lecture. The last time we looked at seven keys uh, uh, to help us understand how Revelation teaches us how to approach it. Uh, Approach it expecting that it will reveal Jesus to us. Not that it will obscure things, confuse us, but that it will show us Jesus. Uh, Come expecting that it will be in symbolic form, a book to be... Uh, seen, as it were, Uh, come expecting that the Old Testament is going to give us the symbolic vocabulary for making sense of the visions given to John. Come expecting that what Revelation says to the first century churches touches on their experience as well as ours. It's not just distant from them, so you need to live in the late 20th century to be able to get the point. Uh, It's for a church under attack. The point is that Christ has won, already won, the great victory. We've seen those keys. Now I want to go a little deeper into how is this book put together, because I think that's, that's crucial. And the, the, uh, the title of this, this message, Framing the Puzzle Pieces, comes from my experience as a young boy, actually, visiting my grandparents, uh, who were really, really, really old, in my opinion, then. They probably were younger than I am now, but anyway out in the California desert, and they would always have, uh, as my grandpa and grandma who came from Sweden would say, they would always have a jigsaw puzzle, Verkin. Okay, <laughs> always a jigsaw puzzle. Um, and they, it seemed like they, had th- they probably did have thousands of pieces, or at least a thousand pieces. And, it, you know, they were in various stages of being put together. But the one thing I realized that I have remembered now that I'm a really, really, really old grandpa, and I don't always have a jigsaw puzzle working, but right now half of our extended dining table is occupied with a jigsaw puzzle, jigsaw puzzle, uh, is the first thing you really need to do as you're turning all the pieces face up is get all those straight edge pieces so, the, so you can put the frame around. And Jane has heard me complain more than once about jigsaw puzzles. This crummy jigsaw puzzle manufacturer left two of the edge pieces out. They're on the floor of the factory someplace. And then months later, well, weeks later sometimes, I will come humbly and admit that they were there. I just didn't spot them. But the frame, you know, and I think Revelation, with all the visions and all the imagery, sometimes feels very confusing. And as we talked a little bit about recapitulation or different video camera angle replays last hour, uh, I think that is so helpful because the temptation is to read Revelation as though it were simply one continuous story. So that if John saw this here, that must refer to some event that happened before what John saw here, which happened before something that John saw here. I know I'm going the opposite way from you. I should go the other way. I'm, you're thinking, in, you should be thinking in Hebrew now. So but you get the point, right? That's a big problem. Let me just illustrate one to you, and then we'll see how important it is to pay attention to some of the boundary markers. If you look at chapter 6, and you go down to verse 12, the sixth seal, 
The lamb is opening the seals one by one. We'll talk a little bit more about what that signifies as he has received the scroll. He's opening the seals. I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. That's pretty cataclysmic, right? So if you turn over then to chapter 8, when we get into trumpets, and we look at chapter 8, verse 10, the third trumpet is sounded. If you, you know, this is obviously later in the book. And if you read this as, if it's later in the book, if it's later in John's visions, it's got to be later in history. Then you get a little confused because now you, the third angel blew his trumpet and a great scar, star fell out of heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell, oh no, I'm sorry, I was wrong, 12. That's what I meant, not, not 10. Blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, likewise a third of the night. But I thought all the stars fell from the sky. Who put the stars back up in the sky? Or does this vision here show us something that in a sense ha will happen or has happened, or is happening, before the cataclysm that John saw with the sixth seal. Yes, that's what is happening. The sixth seal is really a preview of the very end already. It's already a preview of what John will later see when the first heaven and earth run away, and we learn about the mountains and the islands all being removed, and the sun and the stars and the sky all being shaken as the Lamb comes back to make way for the new heavens and the new earth. So already as early as the sixth seal, we're being shown a preview of things that would happen that are still actually future for us as well. And that happens over and over again. That's why keeping this video replay, camera angles, in mind recapitulation is so very helpful. So let's think a little bit about the structure of the book of Revelation. In one sense, it's very simple. The mega structure is there is a prologue or a preamble in the first eight verses. And then there's the body, which starts with the vision given to John of the one like a son of man, chapter 1, verses 9, and goes all the way almost to the end of the book. And then there's a kind of an epilogue in chapters 22, verses 6 through 21. <coughs> and there are lots of echoes of the prologue in the epilogue, uh, among other things that Jesus says, the Lord God says in chapter 1, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Chapter 22, Jesus says, I'm coming quickly, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Chapter 1, the time is at hand. Chapter 22, don't bind up the book, the time is at hand. A lot of echoes, so that's why it shows us those are kind of the bookends. But now what do we do with the body? How do we relate the body uh, to, to the various points within the body. And again, what we heard in our first session as we heard chapter 1, uh, there's a, a clue already here in uh, chapter 1. Uh, first in verse 11, when John hears the voice, the voice says, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. And then later on when he turns to see the voice, and the voice is coming from one like a son of man who is radiant in the glory that we heard described there. <clears throat> and then he says, verse 19, write the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after these things. After these things. After this, the ESV says, but it's actually a plural at that point in the Greek. So that's yeah, helpful anyway. So there's a little bit of debate about verse 19. Are the things that he's already seen simply that vision of the Son of Man? Which may be. Or it may be that this is actually looking ahead to the whole book. Everything you've seen 
breaks down into two pieces, things that are and things that will be after these things. Things that are, almost certainly, are Jesus' description of the conditions of the seven churches of Asia Minor, from Ephesus all around the loop that I drew in the last hour and down to Laodicea inland and kind of just east of Ephesus. Uh, Those are the conditions of the churches. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, after this, John said, says, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, whose voice is that? You heard it last hour, right? It's Jesus' voice, right? The voice that he heard sounded like a trumpet. He turned to look, and he saw one like a son of man. So it's Jesus again saying, come up here. I will show you what must take place after these things. Exact echo of 119. So from chapter 4, 1 and on, we're talking about things that are future from the standpoint of the first century churches. Kind of. Kind of, right? Because these are not hermeneutically or hermetically. Either way, you now know hermeneutics, because Palmer taught us that word. They're not sealed compartments. In a certain sense, when we get to the end of chapter 11, that's another point, uh, like seal 6, we get to chapter 11, we hear the seventh trumpet, the last trumpet, Chapter 10, the angel explains to John, when that last trumpet sounds, there's no more delay. That's the end of history. That's the end of history. When the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and the destroyers of the earth will be destroyed, and the martyrs will be vindicated. 11, end of history. And then there's a vision of heaven opened, and then we get to 12 which is the very, (coughs) very heart of the book. And now we're back with a woman about to give birth to a son who will rule the nations with the rod of iron, and the dragon is intent on destroying the son. So we're back to an event. So clearly, now we're at an event. It's symbolically portrayed, but it's clearly an event that has already happened in history from the standpoint of those first century churches, not just us, but them. It's the coming of Christ. It's the birth of the Messiah as the offspring of the woman who will crush the serpent's head. It's really, as I said in the last hour, it's the whole ministry of Jesus, earthly ministry of Jesus, in, you know, the the glimpse of the glimpse of the eye, because he's born and he's caught up to heaven. But we know there's a lot that's gone on between then. He's sustained every temptation of the evil one. He's offered up himself for our sins. He's been raised from the dead. He's ascended to heaven. He's at the right hand of God. And as we saw last hour, because I couldn't quite hold it back from tomorrow, but you have to be back for tomorrow. The result of all that is the accuser of the brothers has been cast down. Christ's death has robbed Satan of his right to accuse us because we've, we conquer now as we trust him by the blood of the Lamb. So now we're back, see, chapter, 12, chapter 11, end of history. Chapter 12, oh, we're back at the turning point of history when the offspring of the woman uh, comes. So there's not a complete ceiling of Revelation 1 through 3 being only about things present to the first century churches. And of course, the letters speak of the future. And then Revelation, <coughs> Revelation 4 through 22 focus on things future to John's first century audience. <clears throat> but in a sense, the video recording is run back from the first, to the first coming of Christ. <clears throat> I get more excited than my voice will let me get. Shame on it. <clears throat> so those, but still, by and large, that, that, that's, that's a breakdown that's actually given to us in chapter 4, verse 1, the things that will take place after these things from the standpoint of our first century brothers and sisters. 
<clears throat> now, there are also some major transitional signals within this body of the various visions given to John. <clears throat> and one is the expression, in the Spirit, uh, which signals the beginning of a new cycle of visions, uh, which may then, re again, go back over the same perspective, the same realities, but from a different perspective. So in the Spirit, twice we hear John say, I became in the Spirit. You may have noticed that in verse, chapter 1, verse 10, I changed that was to became. It really has to do with something that... John isn't just saying, the Holy Spirit was with me, or I was in the Holy Spirit. He was saying, I became in the Spirit. That's a signal of prophetic inspiration. I became in the Spirit. <clears throat> And uh, as he became in the Spirit, he's then brought into this vision of the Son of Man. Uh, who, uh, and that vision then leads to chapters 2 and 3, where the Son of Man <clears throat> speaks to each of these seven churches, from Ephesus all the way around the loop to Laodicea. And we call these the letters to the churches, and that's fine, but... More specifically, they are imperial edicts to the churches. <coughs> the thus says, or the ESV renders it, the words of him, uh, thus says, is a formula used by kings when they're issuing edicts to their subjects. And it's a formula that uh, we find in a couple places in the Old Testament. I didn't put those in my notes, so you'll have to track it down someplace. But that's what Jesus is doing. He's not just saying, I'm writing you a little letter. He's saying, I'm the king. <clears throat> and here's what I see. I know. I know your works. Some good. Some not so good. No, worse than not so good. Some unfaithful. Uh, I know your situation. I know where you're being tried and tested. But he's speaking with that kind of authority. So that first vision then leads to... Um, leads to these edicts, uh, and John is caught up to heaven in the Spirit uh, to receive that first vision of the Son of Man. Then again, at chapter 4, verse 1, here's the transition from things that are to things that will take place after these things. So Jesus says to him in verse 1, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. At once, I became in the Spirit, and behold, a, stone, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And so the vision that follows, we're going to look at that in more depth in a few minutes, but then even more depth tomorrow afternoon, the vision of the enthroned uh, sovereign of the universe. <coughs> so those two are marked, the beginning, that in the Spirit, I became in the Spirit, mark early beginnings of vision cycles. Then later on, in chapter 17 and 21, in the Spirit reappears, but now it's as an angel appears to John to take him away in the Spirit. In chapter 17, the angel takes him away in the Spirit to see the prostitute, Babylon, who has persecuted the saints and who has made the kings drunk with the wine of her pleasure and her lust. But then, by contrast, in chapter 21, after Babylon has fallen, and Babylon by that point really has fallen, after the beasts and the dragon have been destroyed, at that point, then an angel says to John, come and I will show you the bride of the Lamb. And the angel takes him away in the spirit. This has Old Testament roots. You're probably surprised that I'm going to say something in Revelation has Old Testament roots, right? I'm just making sure you're still awake out there. <laughs> Ezekiel is caught up in the Spirit and in vision transform, transported. Chapter 8, he's transported to see Jerusalem. Chapter 11, he sees the house of God. Chapter 43, he sees the inner course of the house of God. Every one of those, the angel, the Spirit takes him to see those things. So there's, there's echo of Ezekiel. There, So those, that's a marker of opening vision cycles, the opening of vision cycles. 
that we need to pay attention to. And then if we add a little bit more texture to that, <clears throat> the scenes of heaven opened. Some of them are already included in what I've just said, but there are others where you, John gets a glimpse into heaven and sees God's sanctuary there introduce vision cycles. And I put a footnote there of a book I think I mentioned in the last uh, session that it was very helpful to me. Michael Wilcock, part of a series that our university press has published, The Message of Revelation, I Saw Heaven Opened. The news, newest edition, you will find The Message of Revelation is the title, and I Saw Heaven Opened, the subtitle, but it's the same book. <coughs> the Scenes of Heaven Opened. So John sees the Son of Man among the lampstands. And that leads to the Son of Man addressing the churches in the letters. John sees heaven opened. You heard that in chapter 4. A door opened in heaven. And he sees God on the throne. And the four living ones. And the 24 elders. And the angels. And the thousands of millions of angels. And the, the Lamb approaching. We're going to get back to that one tomorrow for sure. But that leads to the cycle of the breaking of the seals. When the Lamb receives the scroll begins to open the seals. So that's the beginning of the seals cycle. And with the breaking of the seventh seal, this is after the sixth seal, which I said was a preview of the very end, the breaking of the seventh seal, it's silent. There was silence in heaven for half an hour. I think, what? What is that about? <clears throat> well, in one sense, obviously chapters 4 and 5 make, make it very clear that heaven is a place full of glorious sound. Living ones and elders and the living ones and the elders and the myriads of angels and then everything everywhere all praising God. Suddenly there's silence. And the silence is a silence of anticipation because we're about to start a new cycle. And what John sees there are trumpets, seven angels with trumpets who are going to sound their trumpets. But he also sees, rising like incense, the prayers of the saints. And that sets the scene. It's silent so the prayers of the saints can be heard. Because when the trumpets sound, God is giving kind of final warnings to his enemies. One trumpet blast after another, after another, after another, until, as we saw a few minutes ago, the last trumpet where there's no more delay, the end of history, again, in chapter 11. So the silence in heaven and the altar of incense begins that cycle of trumpets. <clears throat> and at the end of 11... Our, our English uh, versions, maybe the chapter division, I think Mil Wilcock has pers persuaded me the chapter division is not quite happy. I think chapter 12 should start with chapter 11, 19, because that does, that vision of God's temple in heaven opened, the Ark of the Covenant visible within the temple, the lightning, the, the rumblings, the peals of thunder, that's the beginning of a different kind of vision cycle. Um, some scholars think, well, this is if, if we've got seven seals and we've got seven trumpets and we know we're going to have seven bowls down the road of peace, chapter 16, then maybe we have seven sets of seven. Wouldn't that be cool? Seven times seven? Or Wilcox says, maybe we have eight sets of seven. It's like a jubilee. Those are good ideas. I'm not persuaded. It partly, the part of me that's not so persuaded, and I'm not going to build a lot on it, is I'm thinking of my brother and my sister sitting in the church of Smyrna, hearing this all read aloud, and as they're listening, they hear first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seals broken, seventh seal broken, and so on, through the trumpets, and eventually through the bowls. Are they really expected to keep tabs on one through seven when we get to the woman and the dragon and her son and the dragon expelled from heaven and all that takes place in those next, the, the beast called out of the, 
out of the uh, chaotic sea. I just have trouble imagining, even though they've got a better memory than we do, because we're so text-dependent, I just have trouble imagining them thinking, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about those which are not numbered by John. So, anyway, we're not going to go with there. But the opening of the temple, absolutely, Wilcock has me persuaded on that. That's the beginning of that scene. And then another cycle where John sees the martyrs beside the sea of glass in chapter 15, which does lead to the cycle of seven with the bowls of wrath. And then John is carried in the spirit to see Babylon, the prostitute. And then again, heaven is opened as the conquering word comes and defeats the beast. And, I'm going to argue, defeats the beast and the dragon and all their followers in one last battle. We're going to come back to that, because yes, between chapter 19 and chapter 20, verses 7 and following, there is a thousand years, but it's not necessarily numerical. I mean, it's not necessarily successive. So we'll come back to that. And then, of course, John sees the new heaven and the new earth, the holy city descending from heaven, and he's carried in the spirit to see the bride. Keep those pieces distinct in your mind. And that means we need to think a little bit more about some of the cycles of seven, or what are sometimes called heptads. That's from a Greek term, a uh, set of seven. Uh, there are four clearly marked ones, as I say here on Page two, number three, letters, seals, trumpets, and bowls. Within these, these all, in one way, shape, or form, well, the letters are not so much judgment, although there is judgment and commendation for the churches. But the judgment heptads, the cycles of seven showing judgment, seals, trumpets, and bowls, also have their own kind of subdivisions in them. So those three sets of seven, there is four grouped together, and then the other three. So for the seals, there are four riders. Uh, the riders that come out are on different colored horses, white, red, black, green, actually, the green of a corpse. Okay, And they symbolize, white symbolizes conquest, some take that to be the gospel conquest because the rider on the white horse in 19 is Jesus, clearly. Because that rider on the white horse is grouped with the other three, I'm more inclined to agree with the Reformation artist, Albrecht Dürer. You may have seen his woodcut, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. That's, that's danger, too. So conquest, the desire for more territory. Think Russia today. What does that lead to? Bloodshed. And famine. Third seal. Interestingly, in the third seal, the prices of the grains skyrocket, but the oil and wine are not affected. For John's first century readers, what will that tell them? Well, oil and wine are local crops. You can grow those in Turkey. For grain, you depend on Egypt, probably. It's kind of the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. And if war is disrupting the trade, the trade routes, then wheat is going to be expensive and oil and wine are going to be cheap, but you can't just eat on, you know, live on oil and wine. So that would be an expression for them. It's, it's famine, and then finally disease, which includes, of course, for the ancient world, it includes the bubonic plague. Uh, and, uh, and which is a terrifying thing, and especially for a city that is, it is surrounded and besieged. The plague can, can spread out, so it's disease and death. Um, those four belong together. And then five, six, and seven. Five, John sees, actually a, a, view, a, a glimpse of heaven there, but it's the fifth seal, where he sees those who have lost their heads for Jesus. I mean, literally. Been beheaded for Jesus under the altar in heaven, crying out, Lord, how long until you avenge our blood? So in a sense, John has seen four instruments of human conquest and violence that are in the control of the Lamb because he's breaking the seals. And why is he allowing this kind of judgment to go on the earth? It doesn't affect everybody all the time. 
It affects certain proportions of people. Why? Because his, his martyred saints are crying out how long. And then the sixth seal, as I said, really shows a preview of the end. And the seventh seal gives us the silence uh, that lead us into the trumpets. So there's the four plus three. For the trumpets and the bowls, uh, the set of four, each affect, the judgments affect earth, sea, freshwater sources, springs and rivers, and the sky. In the trumpets, a third are affected by those. In the bowls, it's total. Uh, and that fits with the six plus fun, one thing. And then the other uh, three, the, for the trumpets, uh, five, six, and seven are called the three woes. Uh, and the woes have to do with, number six has to do with the great battle that's coming because it has to do with the drying of the Euphrates River. In the imagery, from the Euphrates comes the invaders, comes the Babylonians, comes the Assyrians. Uh, so that's the imagery that's presented there. Um, and, oh, I didn't write one down here. But any, oh, yeah, the... the uh, um, the demons coming out of the pit that we talked about before, right? <coughs> and then uh, the seventh trumpet gives us uh, another preview of the kingdom of God conquering the world. And the last three in the bowls affect the beast and the kings gathered at the Euphrates to fight and the city of Babylon. So there's a four plus three. But what I think is more interesting is there's a six plus one breakdown of the seven, especially for the seals and the bowls. Uh, I mentioned that I got a lot of help from William Hendrickson's More Than Conquerors, uh, and I learned about recapitulation from that little book. But Hendrickson thinks every one of the cycles covers exactly every one of, the, there's a view of the whole of history. I'm not so persuaded that they're exactly the same. And part of it has to do with the six plus one. For the seals, you've, heard this, you've seen the sixth seal, and then between the sixth and the seventh, there is an interlude. There's chapter seven. And in chapter seven, at the end of six, people are desperate at the end of history. They're saying, who can survive? And chapter seven says, well, the people who are marked by the mark of the Lamb are the ones who are going to survive the wrath of God. And in one sense, they sound like 144,000 Israelites, but boy, what they look like is a countless multitude from all the ethne. Palmer, we practiced nations, not Gentiles, nations, right? They're, that's the people of God protected. And as Wilcock points out in his book, that kind of slows everything down a little bit. It reminds us that God's patience is waiting till he gathers all his people in. And then finally, the end comes. Same thing when you get to the trumpet cycle. You get to the sixth trumpet, and then before the seventh trumpet, there's this interlude. And a lot happens in the interlude. An angel brings the now open scroll, since the Lamb has broken all the seals, and the angel gives the open scroll to John and says, eat it, the way God told Ezekiel to eat his word and then speak it. But also, John has shown visions of how God is going to protect his people even as they suffer. Uh, and so I think that, plus the fact that in the seals and in the trumpets, there's kind of an emphasis on God holding back. Uh, a third of mankind or a quarter of mankind is destroyed in the seals. A third of mankind is destroyed in the trumpet. It says that these. this is... The way the world works, there's a lot of suffering, but God's still holding back. And it's only when you get to the bulls, there's no interlude. And there's no percentages and there's no fractions. It's complete. So uh, that, I think, is helpful to keep in mind as well. So now, how do we get the big picture of all this? And this is where I came up with a chart. You know, I taught for the book of Revelation for years, and people kept saying, what, you don't have a chart? <laughs> and finally, I did come up with a chart. So you've got your chart here. Um, and notice what we do here. From, right, from left to right is the flow of history. Okay, there's the flow of the events. 
And by and large, chapters 2 and 3 are the things that are, and chapters 4 and following are the things that shall occur after these things, although there's some overlap. Also, there's the age of God's restraint of his wrath and of Satan's power. It's the ordinary life that we're living now under God's providence. He's not exerting his wrath full force, and he's keeping Satan from gathering a global international conspiracy of nations. He can persecute the church in a lot of ways, but he can't pull all the nations together to persecute the church. So it's God restraining Satan as well. And then there's consummation, again, that will follow that. The coming, Christ's second coming, the last battle, the last judgment, the new heavens and the new earth. So that's the flow of history. But now how do the visions break down in the flow of history? Well, among things that are, moving down now, this is the flow from top to bottom. This is the unfolding of the order of visions in the book of Revelation. Okay? So <laughs> things that are... These are the letters to the seven churches. Things that will take place after this, we have the vision of God enthroned and the Lamb and the seals. After this, there are all kinds of judgments that are going to come on the world. The instruments are conquest, bloodshed, famine, disease, death, but they're all in the hands of the Lamb. He's in, in charge. Why does he send these kinds of disasters on the world? because he's zealous for the vindication, ultimately, of his martyrs. He's listening to his martyrs' uh, lament. And what will happen, seal six, well, it's going to happen at the end, that the whole cosmos, not just the earth, not just an earthquake, it's a cosmos quake. Heaven and earth are going to shatter. But before that, interlude. See the interlude among the oranges? Oranges are the seals. Before that, God is sealing and protecting his own people. And God's patiently waiting. And he, he's, he's bringing judgment, but not fully yet. And why is he bringing judgment? Seal 5 says, because of the martyred saints. And seal 7 says, because of the suffering saints on earth. Because the prayers of the saints are going up in this silence. Uh, okay? which leads to the trumpets, which I would suggest also are another camera angle on the same sorts of disasters that fall in human history all, over, all the time, a restrained implementation of the Lamb's wrath. And then trumpets 5 and 6 seem to be escalating impl implementation, then trumpet 7 brings us to the end. But between 6 and 7, here are the new interludes where the angel gives John the scroll. John eats the scroll, so he's ready to prophesy. And the angel also explains when the seventh trumpet sounds, no more delay, no more patience. But before that, God is protecting his sanctuary, his holy city. Suffering, yes, but not apostasy, not complete apostasy. God's protecting. So that's chapters two. Uh, 10 and most of 11. Get to the end of history. Trumpet 7. The kingdoms, the destroyers are destroyed and Christ's kingdom is consummated. And now we're at the heart of the book. And so the videotapes run back before these churches were planted to the coming of the Messiah in fulfillment of God's promise in Genesis 3.15. To his coming, to his Death, which has cast Satan out of heaven. Look more at that tomorrow. Uh, which has def um, disbarred Satan. He can no longer function as a prosecutor of God's people. We see him prosecuting in Job a little bit, but his, his charges against Job didn't really stick because he said, Job's just in it for the money. Uh, he loves you because you pay him. And that... That wasn't true. Uh, Job was confused, and Job said some things he shouldn't have said, and he was right to put his hand on his mouth when the Lord finally appeared to him. But Job was innocent of those charges. On the other hand, when you get to the vision given to Zechariah in Zechariah 3, 
And Satan there, the accuser, is standing at the elbow of Joshua the high priest, the one who's supposed to be able to intercede for the people of God. And Satan's accusing him. You take one look at him, and you realize those accusations are absolutely true. He is filthy. He is defiled. He is unfit to go into the presence of God. And the accuser is right to accuse him. But Satan is rebuked. And Joshua, the high priest, is re-robed in holy righteousness. And Joshua is told, you are a preview. You are a sign. Sign. Important word, right? You are a sign. When the branch comes, I'm going to remove the iniquity of this people in a single day. So there's a preview in Zechariah 3. Zechariah is given a preview of what the branch, Jesus, came to do. And to silence and disbar our accuser. So those two visions, back to back, talk about the victory of Christ where Satan is defeated, thwarted, as we're going to see tomorrow, but not ultimately destroyed. Hence, the church continues to live, continues to witness, and continues to suffer. And those, those two visions are crucial. And then chapters 13, 14, uh, 13 shows us some of the weapons that the dragon is going to use to persecute the church. 14 gives us another scene of heaven uh, and, the, and some warnings about harvests that all anticipate and lead to the bowls heptad, the cycle of seven of the bowls in chapters 15 and 16. Uh, and those bowls lead really to the introduction of Babylon. Babylon's mentioned once in 14, but Babylon, the city that sits on the beast, so it, it's, it's this economy, political and economic entity that rests on violence, rests on Rome's coercive power and any nation's coercive power, and beguiles people by all the promises of wealth and pleasure. Uh, and so then Babylon is revealed, Babylon's destroyed, uh, and we see Babylon dispensed with, then we see the beast dispensed with, and then we will see the dragon dispensed with, and it's, they're really dispensed with in the same last battle in chapter 19, chapter 20, uh, even though there's an interlude as it were, between 19 and 20, that shows a thousand years where the dragon is bound, cast down in chapter 12, front, can't destroy the child of the woman, cast down and disbarred from being our accuser, and now he's bound so he cannot deceive the nations, the nations any longer. And the gospel, as I said earlier, I think that's, the, that's, that's it's a missions passage. The gospel's going out. Because, as the apostles said, that there was a time when God left the nations in darkness, but not now. Now, everybody is hearing the gospel. Now, the promise uh, that Paul and Barnabas quote from Isaiah, uh, I have made you a light to the nations to bring salvation to the earth, ends of the earth, which is a promise, first of all, obviously to Jesus himself, the suffering servant. But Paul and Barnabas, no, Paul and... Yeah, there's, it's Paul and Barnabas still in chapter 13. They hadn't changed teams yet. Uh, Paul and Barnabas, can, because they're in Christ, the Lord said to us, I've made you a light to the nations to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And that's what's going on in, uh, in the thousand years until the final view, the second video angle on the last battle, the last judgment. And then 20, 21, 22, the new heavens and the new earth. So we come back through this same piece of history several times over from several different camera angles. Uh, and each time we see a little bit something more about what is going on, what has happened as a result of Christ's first coming, coming what is presently happening uh, as the church is 
advancing, but also suffering, as the dragon cannot destroy the church, but can certainly harass the church through military threat, political threat, religious deception, the false prophet, the beast from the earth, through pleasure, luxury, affluence, the Babylon, the, the, the prostitute Babylon, uh, but cannot destroy the church. And then several times over, we're brought to the end of history to see the ultimate victory of God and his people.